my name is Danny Mustafa. I am the co-president here um, with Coalition for Peace and Justice in the Middle East. I'm a freshman here at UNM. And I would like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you so much. And um, we have some, I'd like to thank some co-sponsors here. Um, the UNM American Studies and Peace Studies Department, along with the UNM Coalition for Peace and Justice in the Middle East. Thanks um, to our other co-sponsors, Amnesty International at UNM, Coalition for Immigration, Race, and Social Justice, UNM Fair Trade Initiative, UNM Muslim Student Association, Answer Coalition, New Mexico, Another Jewish Voice Albuquerque, BDS New Mexico, Cambio, the Grey Panthers of, Grey, of Greater uh, Albuquerque, and the Coalition to Stop 30 Billion. And also, um, this, after this event, there's going to be a couple more this week. Um, you can see flyers at our table out in the front. And um, Arish Jafari, a Palestinian youth women's leader, is going to be here to speak. At, she's from Dehesha Refugee Camp. And this is going to be November, 8, or November 9th, this Tuesday, at 12.30 p.m. in the sub Mirage and Thunderbird room up in the third level. And also Poets Against Apartheid, um, Poetry Slam, Tuesday night, 6.30 p.m., Warehouse 508 on the First Street. Pick up flyers um, at our table again. And um, I'd just like to make a statement about um, TIA craft real quick. The Albuquerque community is involved with a nationwide campaign asking TIA craft to divest from corporations which are um, directly benefiting from the Israeli occupation. Some of these corporations include Caterpillar, Motorola, and Northrop Grumman. And if you would like to know more information, please see, I, please see the TIA CREF table um, back there. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Lesfield, a professor here at UNM. Good evening. I'd like to welcome Ali Abunima to New Mexico. Uh, he's going to be introduced by Ahmed Asad, uh, who will come after me. There's a few things I'd like to say before um, Ahmed introduces Ali. Um, the people who are here tonight, who have come to this event, have come through various kinds of routes and various sorts of reasons. We have different opinions. This is a contentious issue in the city of Albuquerque, in the state of New Mexico, in this country, and globally. And in this discussion that's going to ensue as a result of uh, Ali's presentation, Mr. Abunima's presentation, I'd like to urge all of you to show respect for one another, um, to not use name calling or epithets, any kind of uh, use of a word that's hurtful, Remember that we're here not necessarily to agree with one another, but to hear one another and to engage in dialogue. Um, I'm an anthropologist at this university. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I work with indigenous peoples in North, Central, and South America. I'm also a Jewish American. I was raised by fervent Zionists, refugees from Europe, and Holocaust survivors. I have had my own journey to come to this position to be here, to welcome Ali Abu Nima, to be part of this event. And I think all of you who are here have had your own roads here. And I want to stress that necessity to honor one another, to listen to one another, and to always try and see in the words of another person the humanity of that person. So please, in the discussion that follows this, try and, 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 uh, and find that respect in yourself for the other person. So I'd like to now introduce uh, Ahmed Asad who's a Palestinian-American attorney and the owner of Asad Associates since 1995. His practice is in criminal defense, civil rights, and personal injury, and he has a limited practice in the field of international law. He was appointed by the International Criminal Court as ad hoc counsel to the Harun Kutiab in Darfur. He's also a member of the defense team representing uh, Abdrahim al-Mashiri, who was charged with masterminding the bombing of the USS Cole. Uh, Mr. Ased has been in various organizations that are devoted to the establishment of a Palestinian state and in bringing about a lasting peace between the Palestinians and Israelis. He's also a past president, <clears throat> excuse me, of the American Arab 
Anti-Discrimination Committee and its New Mexico chapter, and also serves as board member for the ACL ACLU in Albuquerque. He also would like you to all know that he is married with five wonderful activist children. And so I'd like to welcome Mr. Ossett. Good evening. <clears throat> when I was uh, first asked uh, to introduce uh, Ali uh, tonight, I was extremely delighted and honored. And then uh, I went into panic mode uh, because uh, uh, my uh, um, information and my knowledge related to the concept of a one-state solution was mainly limited to uh, a couple of articles, a discussion here or there. So the first thing I did was buy his book. Um, and uh, it was, it's titled One Country. I, I think that they may be uh, available here. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic um, book, I encourage you all to read it and to understand uh, the dimensions involved uh, in what Ali uh, states in his book and what we'll hear about, I'm sure, tonight. But in reading the book, it certainly reminded me of the failed uh, current and past attempts at um, resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, ending the occupation and bringing about a peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, if you look at the scenario today, uh, things are not getting better. They're actually getting worse. Um, the the uh, attempts are, have failed and, has, uh, and are disastrous. We look at Palestinians in the West Bank con continuously reminded of the occupation. We, we see the expansion of settlements without any international consequences. Uh, we see the systematic cleansing of Palestinians in Jerusalem. We have one million Palestinian, Israeli Palestinians that fear of losing their identity, uh, that fear of being uprooted and shipped somewhere God knows where. We have one, one point, over 1.2 million Palestinians that still are imprisoned in Gaza, cut off from the rest of the world, and live in horrific conditions. With these brutal facts in mind, I have been... Um, through this process, convinced that a new direction is needed. And maybe this one state solution is the, is, is the direction that we need. It is certainly a viable option. And hopefully tonight, uh, this, we will hear more from Ali with regards to this topic. And you will go away understand, more understanding of this concept. I believe this concept is based on hope. I believe it's a positive message rather than a negative one. And I wish all of you walk away tonight having a better understanding and realizing that this may be the direction we need. I certainly have been convinced. So in doing so, let me go ahead and, uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, Ali. Ali Abu Nam is a journalist and co-founder of the Electronic Intifada, a not-for-profit independent online publication about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Electronic Intifada addresses the prevailing pro-Israeli slant in U.S. media coverage by offering information from a Palestinian perspective. The, uh, our, our U.S. media coverage by offering information from a Palestinian perspective, our views on the conflict are based firmly on u universal principles of international law and human rights conventions. And our reporting is built on a solid foundation of documented evidence and careful fact-finding and fact-checking. Abu Nam is also author of the book One Country, a bold proposal to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which proposes to revive the ideas of one state shared by two peoples. Born in Washington, D.C., Abu Namas spent his early years in the United, the United Kingdom and Belgium before returning to the United States to attend college. His mother is originally from the village of Lifta, which is now controlled by Israel, but became a refugee in the 1948 Palestinian exodus. His father is from the village of Batir, now in the West Bank. Abu Nam is a graduate of Princeton University and the University of Chicago and is a frequent speaker and commentator on the Middle East and, a cont and contrib contributing regu regularly to numerous publications. Without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to uh, introduce Ali Abu Nam tonight.
I'm good, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Wow, I never imagined that I could fill up a ballroom. Uh, I find that particularly surprising because um, apparently there were some people who didn't want to welcome me in Albuquerque. But it looks like there's a pretty big welcoming committee here. Now, uh, I've just come from Santa Fe, and the dips and troughs in the landscape have done strange things to my ears. So if I suddenly keel over to one side, you'll know what's going on. Well, the first thing I want to say is I want to thank everybody who worked so hard to uh, make my visit here possible. I've been looking forward to coming to New Mexico for such a long time, and uh, uh, there were many individuals, um, Gida Lester, uh, Dania Mustafa, who spoke a few moments ago, who I was in contact with, who uh, really worked to make this happen. Uh, but I know that they weren't alone. I know that any event like this takes many, many more people, and probably whose names I don't know, but I just want to assure all of you how much I appreciate the effort, particularly students who have uh, other things to do uh, other than organize events. And uh, I'd like to thank the UNM Coalition for Peace and Justice in the Middle East, the UNM Students Organizing Actions for Peace, nice acronym SOAP, the UNM American Studies and Peace Studies Departments, and there's a, a large number of groups listed on the flyer who have also co-sponsored co this event. I must say that uh, although uh, I have uh, developed a pretty thick skin, as you have to when you talk about Palestine, uh, I must say that the sorts of attacks made against me in the past few weeks in the run-up to my visit here by the Jewish Federation of New Mexico and by the Hillel at the University of New Mexico surprised me. Uh, I have been compared to the Ku Klux Klan. I have been called an anti-Semite. Uh, I have been accused of wanting to destroy Israel uh, and all sorts of other things. So some of you may have expected uh, an ogre to appear before you rather than a fellow human being. My response to those uh, attacks has been to say that I hope those who launched them are here in the room tonight. I hope they're here. And uh, I can assure them, as I can assure all of you, that I'll be very happy to take all your questions. And you here will be the judges of what I say. Because I stand in front of several hundred people and I'm ready to answer your questions and to stand up for what I believe in. Now, uh, the, I think ultimately what this comes down to now is what is our vision? If we were to ask some of those who have turned sadly to vilification and defamation rather than constructive dialogue, what is your vision for the future of the people in Palestine or Israel or whatever you want to call it? What's your vision for them? How do you want them to live? in five years, in 10 years, or 50 years' time. And I don't hear a vision. I don't hear a vision, at least not one that I can relate to. What I hear is a lot of hate, of speech which denigrates other people, 
speech that ignores facts, ignores reality. And what I want to put before you is a vision. And it's a very simple one. It's that all the people who live in Palestine and Israel, five and a half million Palestinians, five and a half million Israeli Jews, and about a million people who would be neither, should enjoy all their human rights. For this, we are being vilified. That we ask that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights be applied to all the people living in Palestine, including Palestinians, and to those who have been violently expelled from Palestine and denied their rights to return for the sole reason that they are, in the eyes of the State of Israel, the wrong type of human being. For me, there is no wrong type of human being. There's only one kind of human being. And that is the vision that I think we have to work towards. But if we want to get to a different reality, we have to recognize the reality today is a very ugly one. We're not going to get through this by simply pretending that if we talk about peace and we have dialogue groups and we have a peace process that goes on forever and ever, that we're going to have a good outcome. We've had now almost 20 years of so-called peace talks that have led to a worsening situation, a dramatically worsening situation for millions of Palestinians. No wonder Israel says, we love peace talks. We love them so much that we'd like them to go on forever and ever. But that's not going to get us to justice and it's not going to get us to peace. We can start on the road to a real just peace by recognizing where we are today and then asking how we get out of it. And where we are today is an ugly, triple-tiered, three-tiered system of apartheid. This is the reality. I understand that Zionists don't like to hear these words. They would prefer to talk about me than to talk about apartheid in Palestine. But I'm not the issue here. The issue is the apartheid in Palestine. And it's a three-tiered system because it affects Palestinians, different groups of Palestinians in different ways. We can think of the Palestinian people as being three broad groups. One group is Palestinian citizens of Israel. I, if we had a chalkboard, I would put up a map here. But these are the survivors of the ethnic cleansing, the Nekba, in 1948. In 1948, 90% of the Palestinians living in what became Israel were forced to leave or fled or were out of the country for study or travel or business or any other purpose and then not allowed to return, creating, through ethnic cleansing, a state with a Jewish majority. But the Palestinian minority remained behind. At that time, about 150,000 people. Today, they're 1.2 million through natural growth, and they're nominally citizens of Israel. They vote for the Knesset, and they live in the country. That's one tier and I'm going to talk about them in a minute. The second tier is Palestinians who live in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the parts of Palestine occupied by Israel since 1967 up to this day. And there you have another approximately four million Palestinians, one and a half million in the Gaza Strip, and about two and a half million in the West Bank. And the third tier of Palestinians are those 
refugees in the diaspora and refugees inside the country as well because 80% of the people in Gaza are refugees. And what we have to see is an end to the three-tiered system of apartheid that targets these three groups of Palestinians if we're to see peace. Let's start with Palestinians in Israel. They're nominally citizens of the state. They vote. But they experience uh, forms of discrimination and inequality that are not just social and economic and cultural, but entrenched in Israeli law. And what we see is this entrenchment in Israeli law becoming more and more uh, extreme. Yesterday in Santa Fe, I spoke to an audience and there was a group of students from the United World Colleges in Santa Fe, which included several Israeli students. And I was really delighted to see them in the room. And they asked some very good questions. One young man in particular, I hope you won't mind me saying his name was Amir. And he said, well, why are you focusing on Israel? You talk about all these negative things, but every country has negative things. The United States has racism. The United States has all sorts of inequalities and problems. I said, that's true, but the difference is that the United States has a vision of a society enshrined in law in which there is equality. We have this in uh, employment uh, discrimination laws, in equal housing opportunity, equal employment opportunity, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. Does this mean we've eliminated racism in this country? Of course it doesn't. But it means we've set legal and constitutional standards that we aspire to and can struggle for. Israel is moving in the opposite direction. It's moving in the direction of entrenching a system of apartheid that uh, is not just a slogan, a nice slogan of a Jewish and democratic state, but is actual apartheid. Uh, sometimes you get a lot of criticism when you use the word of apartheid. I remember when I first started using it to describe the situation in Israel, I was told, well, this is very hurtful and this is very inaccurate. But Israelis themselves use it all the time. On October 31st, Zvi Bar El, the uh, columnist in Haaretz wrote in an article called South Africa is already here. Israel's apartheid movement is coming out of the woodwork and is taking on a formal legal shape. It is moving from voluntary apartheid to a purposeful, open, obligatory apartheid which no longer requires any justification. What does this look like in practice? Here we're in an institution of higher learning. So let's talk about schools. You can see the funding disparities between schools, and I'm only talking now about schools within Israel in its 1948 boundaries. Schools for Jewish students and schools for Palestinian Arab students, separate and unequal. A story from the uh, uh, ynetnews.com, the most widely read news website in Israel, uh, owned by the newspaper Yediat Ahronot, had a story just uh, yesterday, November 6th, called A Lesson in Inequality. It says, the Omer Comprehensive High School boasts beautiful lawns, marble walls, class schedules on plasma screens, soccer fields and a gym, a student radio station, a $4 million annual budget and an 80% matriculation eligibility rate, 80% uh, ach achievement in terms of the high school uh, final requirements. The Segev Shalom High School is located just 12 kilometers away, but there the students study in overcrowded caravans 
with no air conditioning. The matriculation eligibility rate at the Bedouin town school stands at 40%, and the students do not even dream of a gym. This is how the Israeli education system perpetuates inequality. That's just one example uh, which came to light yesterday. If you look at uh, poverty within Israel, not talking about the West Bank and Gaza now, just within Israel, from Israel's official Central Bureau of Statistics, poverty among the Palestinian population inside Israel is over 50%. For the Jewish population, it's 16%. This is not an accident. It's not the result of uh, a tsunami. It's the result of Jewish and democratic state policies that systematically favor one community over another. I mentioned that the Palestinian population within Israel recovered from about 150,000 in 1948 to 1 1.2 million today. In the 62 years of its existence, Israel has built over 700 towns and settlements for Jews. Does anyone know how many towns or developments it has built for the Palestinian population within its borders that has grown tenfold in 62 years? Do you know the name of it? Rahat. Rahat. Good, I'm going to talk about Rahat. Just one. Actually, I thought the number was zero. But Rahat is different because this wasn't exactly a development. It was they expelled the Bedouin from their land and forced them into this settlement against their will. So it, it wasn't really a development in that sense. But if you talk about uh, actual towns, for the expanding population, uh, the, the number is zero, in, in fact. Uh, and so what you see is, naturally, the Palestinian citizens of Israel seeking to find places to live. They have growing families and they need somewhere to live. So they are moving increasingly into Jewish communities. And what has been the reaction? It has been uh, widespread efforts to prevent Arabs moving into Jewish communities. And it's very ugly. An example from Yediat uh, Ahranat on October 22nd. A story appears. You do not want Arabs in Carmiel. Carmiel is a town in Israel. Report to Purple Email. Carmiel's deputy mayor, Oren Milstein, does not want any Arabs in his town. Therefore, he urges the public to report real estate deals with Arabs to a special email address. And his bureau assists the anti-Arab initiative. Uh, they placed ads in the local newspapers. Residents are welcome to turn to us the moment they become aware of an apartment which is about to be sold to someone from one of the surrounding Arab villages. Once a flat in Carmiel is sold to an Arab family, it is a solid fact for generations to come. Milstein intimates that the selling of 30 flats has already been pre prevented in this way. In Safad, in the north, a city which had a predominantly Palestinian population prior to 1948, a few months ago, the chief municipal rabbi, Shmuel Eliyahu, and 17 other rabbis issued a public call to residents not to sell or rent apartments to non-Jews. That was followed by an emergency convention three weeks ago at which speakers lashed out at the influx of Arab students. Incidentally, Arabic is an official language in Israel, although it's not, services are generally not available in Arabic. Uh, and of course, Arabic is the native language of the Palestinian population there. There isn't a single university, Arabic language university, in Israel. None has been allowed, which means that students aspiring to a higher education must go to the Israeli universities. And so uh, a number of Palestinians 
have been attracted to colleges in to the college in Safad. So, uh, <clears throat> ten days ago, I'm reading now from Haaretz on November 3rd. Ten days ago, three Arab students were physically assaulted, one of whom was shot, though not fatally. Two Safad residents, one of them an armed border policeman, were subsequently indicted for the attack, which began when a group of young Jews surrounded the students' apartment shouting slogans such as death to the Arabs and stinking Muslims and hurling rocks and bottles through the windows. Now, what's interesting about this is it's not just Arabs being targeted, but Jews as well. Any Jew who uh, wants to coexist with uh, Arabs may find themselves the target of this sort of intimidation and violence. And this particular Haaretz story focused on Eli Tzvaeli, an 89-year-old resident of Safad, who woke up to find the city plastered with posters naming him and claiming Tzvayeli is returning the Arabs to Safad. It's a crying shame. And he also received numerous phone calls threatening him that if he rented an apartment to Arabs, he, his house would be burned down. And he told Haaretz, I'm scared, but I have an obligation toward these lovely students. They're in school every day and needed a place to sleep at night. Now, this isn't, these aren't um, uh, exceptional. This is becoming typical in Israel. And surveys, those done, for example, by the Israel Democracy Institute, show that these sorts of racist attitudes are very widespread in Israeli society and growing as extremist parties like uh, Avigdor Lieberman's Israel Betenu incite hatred against the Arabs and call for their expulsion. There was a tiny protest in, uh, in Israel uh, yesterday against this. A handful of Israelis turned out, but they made some powerful statements. Professor Shen, the, this is from Yedi Ata Ahronot today, uh, and it says, artists call on stop racist legislation. It quotes a certain Professor uh, Shenhar. He says, imagine a university in a certain country, let's say Germany, and a priest forbidding the residents from renting out apartments to Jews. Here we have a chief rabbi whose salary comes from the taxes paid by you and me, and he's telling people not to rent apartments to Arabs at all costs. We are reaching an unbelievably high level of discrimination and racism we never imagined reaching. I feel a great shame. That's what it means to have a Jewish and democratic state in practice. Uh, <clears throat> the situation of Palestinians in Israel, I mentioned, uh, is not just social discrimination often fanned by politicians in the state, but legal. This discrimination takes a number of forms. I'll mention just a couple. One, of course, is the law of return, uh, the uh, racist law in Israel that says any person anywhere in the world that Israel recognizes as a Jew, Israel doesn't recognize all Jews as Jews. But those Israel recognizes as Jews can uh, move to Israel, gain citizenship, be given housing and job and all sorts of other assistances, enormous efforts to recruit uh, Jews to go and move to Israel in this country. Whereas a Palestinian citizen living in Israel has no right to bring direct relatives and family who may be living in a refugee camp a few miles away in Lebanon or in Jordan or in Gaza or in the West Bank to come and live with them. In 2004, Israel amended its citizenship law to um, forbid Israeli citizens from marrying Palestinians 
from the West Bank, Gaza Strip, or the surrounding countries, and living with them in Israel. So now, if you're an Israeli citizen and you want to marry a Palestinian, you have to leave the country in order to live with your spouse. In this country, people are fighting for marriage equality between, for people of the same sex. In Israel, you don't even have marriage equality for people uh, of different genders. So that um, this does affect, there are a few documented cases of mixed Israeli, uh, Jewish, and Palestinian couples, although that's fairly rare, it does happen. Um, the biggest impact is on Palestinian citizens of Israel, and when the law was passed, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon was very clear that the purpose was demographic control. It was an attempt to reduce the Palestinian population in Israel, or at least to, to uh, slow its growth. And I, don't, I can't think of anywhere else in the world where uh, who you can marry is defined by ethnicity or nationality. I can't think of another country in the world that has <coughs> such a law. If you look at the situation of Palestinians in the West Bank, well, the story there is, is fairly well known. During the uh, period of the so-called peace process, the number of settlers and settlements in the occupied West Bank has grown. All the while, Israel tells us it's committed to peace. It's committed to pieces of the West Bank, bigger and bigger pieces all the time. And uh, what I think is, is important to understand is that the settlements which Israel likes to portray in its propaganda as just benign, you know, we're just building neighborhoods for people. What's wrong with that? Are uh, inextricable from violence. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's think about, you know, because Israelis and some other people are always uh, advising Palestinians, why don't you be like Gandhi or why don't you be like Martin Luther King? Well, let's imagine for a moment that the settlers decide to be like Gandhi. How many settlers would be living on confiscated Palestinian land today if there were a Gandhi-like settlement movement? Would it be half a million settlers living in the West Bank today? I doubt it. Imagine the scene where Israeli settlers go to Palestinian farmers and landowners and they say, we don't believe in violence, but we like your land and also God gave it to us. So would you kindly step aside peacefully because we don't want to hurt you? I don't think the settlers would have found too many takers for that. And as the ethnic cleansing and Judaization intensifies, so does the violence. And increasingly, it is targeting children, who are in fact the majority population among Palestinians. A study released a few days ago from <coughs> Defense for Children International Palestine reports that uh, Palestinian children are coming under increasing attack by a handful of violent extremist Jewish settlers. The study, which was compiled over two years, investigated 38 separate incidents of settler violence toward minors, which resulted in the deaths of three children and injuries to 42 others. In 13 of the cases, settlers opened fire, killing three children and injuring another 10. Physical assault and intimidation was also reported in 15 cases and stone throwing in another nine incidents. Cursing and verbal abuse was documented in almost every case. But th this isn't just the settlers themselves, this is also the state. Remember, the settlers are uh, totally reliant on the state. There would be no Israeli settler movement without the full backing of the Israeli state. And you may have seen the YouTube video of the settler leader, David Berry, <coughs> running over Palestinian children who were allegedly throwing uh, stones at his car. Now, remember, 
whether you agree with throwing stones or not, that these settlers are not coming for tourism. They're coming for the purpose of expelling those children and their families from their neighborhood. So we can hardly be surprised that Palestinians will react. Well, what has been the Israeli response? Has it been to stop the ethnic cleansing of Silwan and Isawiya and Atur and all the other villages in and around occupied Jerusalem? No, it's been to crack down on the children. And they have recently, the Jerusalem P police, part of the occupation forces, are imposing high fines and house arrest on Palestinian children to prevent stone throwing at Israeli vehicles, the Hebrew language daily Ma'ariv reported on Tuesday. A couple of cases are highlighted. Um, sixth graders Muhammad Muhammad and Muhammad Radwan from Beit Ura Tahta said border guards locked them in the bathroom of Petah Tikva detention center and left them for two days with the air conditioning on, naked. The most awful thing that happened was when the soldiers went to the bathroom, they peed on us and did not use the toilet, Muhammad said, adding that one of the soldiers videotaped the incident. Muhammad said he was kicked and beaten with rifle butts during his arrest. These accounts have corroborated the testimony collected by two Israeli rights groups, B'Tselem and Hamoked, detailing, quote, the state-sanctioned ill-treatment of interrogees at the detention center. In a report released by the organizations last week, this report is from Man News Agency, quoting them. Uh, 121 testimonies from detainees indicate a clear pattern of activity by the authorities which constitutes cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. In Hebron, this is from Yedi Ad Ahronat on uh, Friday. A 13 year old boy placed under five month house arrest by the Israeli army on suspicion of throwing stones. A seventh grader from Hebron was arrested in late September on suspicion of hurling stones at Israel Defense Forces soldiers. Now this boy didn't go to Tel Aviv, to a cafe, to find Israelis to throw stones at. These were occupation soldiers who came to his city that he threw stones at, or is alleged on suspicion. The boy's relatives say he is in a serious emotional state and is finding it difficult to recover from his days in prison. He was in prison before he was in house arrest. All he told his family members is that he was handcuffed and chained and was sometimes left alone in a room or in solitary confinement. His friends and teachers have been visiting him in a bid to update him on the study program, which he hardly even began. The boy himself refuses to talk. Asked what he went through during the interrogation in jail, he responds, I don't know, I don't know. So settlement is violence against children in a systematic way. It's necessary. You cannot have Israeli settlement without systematic uh, violence against the population in general and children in particular, perpetrated not only by the settlers but by the Israeli uh, military uh, itself. We see uh, at the same time in the West Bank and in fact throughout Israel an acceleration in the Judaization process, the demolition of Palestinian homes and properties. Human Rights Watch reported in August. The Israeli government it released a statement. The Israeli government should immediately stop the arbitrary destruction of Palestinian homes and other properties in the West Bank and compensate the people it has displaced. Israeli authorities destroyed 141 Palestinian homes and other buildings in July 2010, the largest number in any month since at least 2005, and have already carried out dozens of demolitions in August. This is going on throughout the West Bank. 
just a couple of examples. On Wednesday, October 27th, Israeli soldiers and police forces demolished, uh, uh, and bulldozers demolished, I like to call them Jewish and democratic bulldozers, raised the Bedouin Palestinian encampment in Isawiyah, a village northeast of Jerusalem. Israeli forces destroyed tents and other structures that were home to six families. Elsewhere in East Jerusalem, on October 25th, Israeli police handed out 231 demolition orders to Palestinians in Silwan, Shafat, Beit Hanina, Isawiya, Wadi Dam, and in the Arras area and Wadi Jors and other neighborhoods across the city. Many Palestinian homes in Silwan have already been demolished and many more are under regular threat as the neighborhood has been targeted by the Israeli controlled Jerusalem municipality in Silwan, the settlers are taking over because they want to build a so-called uh, City of David, a Jewish-themed park on where the homes of Palestinians currently stand. Now, these demolitions occur as settlement construction is ex accelerating. Haaretz reported on October 15th that uh, since the so-called settlement freeze, which was never a freeze in the first place, ended, uh, uh, construction of settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem has increased up to fourfold. Um, and we heard mention of Rahat, the Bedouin uh, resettlement camp in the Negev. Or just yesterday, if I can find that paper. Just yesterday, Israeli forces demolished the mosque in Rahat. The French news agency reported, they went into the mosque and arrested those who were praying inside, including me, and drove us outside the city until the operation was over, Yusuf Abu Jamer a local resident was quoted as saying, the police used tear gas canisters and rubber bullets to disperse the outraged residents who took to the streets in protest. Israeli authorities, however, claimed that the mosque did not have an authorization permit. Of course, Israel doesn't give permits to Palestinians to build anywhere. So this violence also came after the Bedouin village of Al Araqib in the Negev was destroyed in the summer five times in a row because each time it was destroyed, the residents vowed to rebuild it. Uh, and they have vowed to rebuild this mosque as well. And it's in this context that Israel demands to be recognized as a Jewish and democratic state. Now, why would any Palestinian in their right mind be willing to accede to such a demand when they know precisely what that means in practice. Gaza is a giant prison for one and a half million people, 80% of them refugees. What's their crime? Well, Israel claims, of course, that it's about security. Half the population in Gaza are children, 750,000 people. We know that the blockade of Gaza, we've known from the pattern, but now we know also from the Israeli government itself, is imposing deliberate p collective punishment on Gaza for political purposes. And I draw your attention to the documents released by Gisha, the, uh, the Legal Center for Freedom of Movement, an Israeli NGO, which obtained Israeli government documents and published them uh, on October 21st. Reading from the Gisha release, the documents reveal that the state approved a policy of deliberate reduction for basic goods in the Gaza Strip. In other words, keeping the population in Gaza deliberately on the edge of starvation or great need. The documents contain a series of formulas created by the Defense Ministry 
to compute product inventory. The calculations are presumed to allow COGAT, that's the acronym for the occupation authorities, to measure what is called the length of breath. The formula states that if you divide the inventory in the Gaza Strip by the daily consumption needs of the residents, in other words, Israel is counting the calories each human in Gaza can absorb. You remember uh, when the siege started a few years ago, Dov Weissglass, the Israeli government advisor, said that we plan to put the people of Gaza on a diet. Well, Gisha released the diet plan. These are war crimes and crimes against humanity because Gaza is an occupied territory under Israel's authority. Israel is the occupying power is obligated to ensure that all the needs of the civilian population are met. And here Israel is conspiring to deprive the population of its needs as a form of collective punishment. And these, under international law, constitute war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, uh, in addition to uh, rationing deliberately rationing the basic supplies for the children of Gaza. Israel banned all sorts of quote-unquote luxury items, including such things as chocolate. Now, I, I'm sure there is a security reason for this, because Israeli citizens would be in grave danger if Palestinians were to fire chocolate-tipped missiles from the Gaza Strip, or cumin-tipped missiles. I happen not to like cumin, but many people in Palestine do. But it's much more than that. During Operation Cast Lead, Israel's brutal attack on Gaza, in which 1,400 people half of them women and children, and the vast majority civilians were massacred in the space of three weeks and thousands of others injured. There was deliberate targeting of the civilian infrastructure, including the water treatment facilities, irrigation facilities, government buildings, the Palestinian Legislative Council uh, was destroyed. Israel's always complaining that uh, the Arabs are not democratic. I think it was Israel's effort to enhance democracy that it bombed the Palestinian Legislative Council. Must have been for democracy. Again, we're in an educational institution, so let's talk about schools. There are 640 schools in Gaza. During Israel's attack, 18 schools were completely destroyed and 280 were damaged. 164 students and 12 teachers from government schools were killed during the military offensive, not necessarily in the schools, but belonging to the schools. Another 86 children and three teachers were killed from the United Nations schools. Since that time, there's been almost no reconstruction of the schools in Gaza because of Israel's ban to this day on construction supplies. Gaza is a prison for one reason. The people in Gaza are the wrong kind of human as far as Israel is concerned. If you change just one thing about Palestinians in Gaza, if they were Jews in the eyes of the State of Israel, the prison gates would open and they would be allowed to return home to their lands, which are mostly empty to this day, or have, in many cases, Jewish National Fund forests planted on them to try to hide the evidence of the ethnic cleansing. 
But most of the lands are empty still. There's plenty of room for Palestinians to return to. The problem is they're the wrong type of human as far as Israel is concerned. If Israel didn't allow them to return because they had the wrong skin color, nobody in this room would argue that it wasn't apartheid. But Israel's definition of who is a Jew and who isn't a Jew is just as arbitrary. It's not voluntary. Israel believes that Judaism can be reduced from its great wealth and diversity and history that thrived in so many parts of the world that it can be reduced to an inherited gene. I think that's terribly denigrating of Jews. This is the three-tiered system of apartheid which Israel operates that is becoming more entrenched. And it is becoming more entrenched with the complicity and assistance of the United States in particular, which provides unconditional backing to Israel and rewards Israel. We've seen this dynamic where all of this uh, expectation that when President Obama came in, he would be uh, tough on Israel. Well, that toughness lasted, what, about a week or two, a few months, when he asked Israel to stop building the settlements. And when asking politely didn't work, they tried offering rewards. A whole laundry list of uh, additional aid to Israel. For what? Israel's not doing anyone a favor by stopping the settlements. Settlements are a violation of international law. There are numerous UN Security Council resolutions not only calling on Israel to stop the settlements, but to dismantle the settlements, as well as the apartheid wall that Israel began constructing in 2003-2004, and which was declared illegal by the International Court of Justice in The Hague in 2004. It was this complicity, this inaction, this failure of the institutions that were supposed to guarantee the rights of indigenous people and people under colonization when the United Nations was founded. It was this failure of the United Nations and the world powers to live up to their treaty obligations. The Fourth Geneva Convention governing the rights of civilian persons under uh, occupation is not optional. All the countries who signed it are obligated to bring to account countries that violated. But what we've seen instead is complicity and enabling from the United States, from the European Union that subsidizes the Israeli occupation through the Palestinian Authority. The Arab states that are complicit with Israel's blockade and siege of Gaza. When Palestinians saw, you know, you go to any Palestinian anywhere, in any refugee camp, in any town, in any part of the United States, and they'll talk to you about the UN and how they put their faith in the United Nations. This wasn't a people who said we want to go to war or we want to use violence. This was a people that said we want to see our rights implemented by the United Nations. We want to see our rights under the Universal Decl Declaration of Human Rights implemented. Yasser Arafat, in 1974, when he went to the United Nations and he made his famous gun and the olive branch speech, he said then, 35, 36 years ago, he said, when we talk about our vision for the future of Palestine, we talk about all the people living there now, today, including the Jews, living in peace, but without discrimination. 
Palestinians made this far-reaching offer as far back as 1974. They didn't say, we want to kick the Jews out. They said, we will live with you. We'll let you stay in our country, but on conditions of equality. Israel rejected that far-reaching offer in 1974. When Israel rejected that far-reaching offer, the Palestinians came up with another far-reaching offer, unprecedented in history. I challenge you to find another people that made such a generous offer to those who colonized their country. It was called the, the two-state solution. And it went like this. Palestinians said, we will relinquish to Israel the 78% of Palestine that was conquered in 1948 and from which 90% of the Palestinians were expelled. And in, in exchange, you allow us to establish a state on the small pieces that are left, on the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Palestinians offered 80% of their historic homeland to Israel and the Israeli response has been consistent from then until this day. That is too much for you. That 20%, the West Bank and Gaza Strip, is too much for you, and we still want more of it. So this is what the point we've reached. And we've reached the point where... We've reached the point where... Excuse me. I'm streaming this live, and uh, the stream was interrupted momentarily. And the people, 25 people listening online will be very cross if I don't bring them back. All right. Yep, we're good. So, of course, without going into the detail about Israel's settlement plan, Israel's settlement construction, the purpose of it was stated very clearly by the Israelis. It was to make a withdrawal from the occupied territories impossible. Well, congratulations, Israel. You've succeeded. We now have a situation of two populations that are inseparable, cannot be partitioned. They are living in a single state, but it is a state that, it is an, that is, in, in effect, an apartheid state with this three-tiered system I've been talking about. It's already what Meron Benvenisti, the Israeli geographer and former deputy mayor of Jerusalem, calls a de facto binational state, with the myth of uh, separate, with, with the myth of Palestinian autonomy. But there's only one government that controls everything in the country. I mean, you know, the so-called Palestinian Authority, the puppet regime in the West Bank, the, the so-called ministers cannot travel without permission from the Israelis. And just the other day, we saw uh, a couple of these uh, Palestinian Authority clowns prevented from leaving the West Bank because they'd said, made statements that Israel agreed with, that, uh, disagreed with, that, that's what was reported. Hamas in Gaza is totally blockaded and uh, controls the interior of Gaza to some extent, but that's it. They don't control if Palestinians can come in or out, if they can get building supplies. Israel controls even the number of calories that's available to people in Gaza. So it's already a single state, but it is a state governed by, of, and for half of its people, the Jewish population only. And our challenge now, after Israel has destroyed any possibility of a two-state solution, is to make sure this is a state where all the people have equal rights, including Israeli Jews. And go to Palestinians anywhere and talk to them. And they say, we're not that interested in what happens to Israeli Jews. We don't want them to leave. We don't, you know, what we want is our rights. We're not interested in revenge. We're interested in our rights. And if we get our rights, Israeli Jews uh, can stay. That's what I hear when I talk to other Palestinians. 
And this is in fact the program that had been the consensus program of the PLO for many years. Now I want to, uh, to uh, finish by talking about how we get there briefly. I've talked for longer than I intended. I believe that BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions, is a peaceful technology to bring about justice and peace. How? Well, we have to recognize, often the portrayal of this conflict is uh, of two sides, two equal sides. This is totally wrong. You don't have two equal sides. On one side, you have a superpower backed by the United States colonizing the country by force. On the other side, you have a dispossessed people. And there's no equality. You can't negotiate from a position of such radical inequality. So BDS seeks to fill the void left by the institutions like the United Nations and the so-called international community that have utterly failed in their responsibilities. And it's a global civil movement that says we will hold Israel accountable. We will exact a price for the status quo. It's not an end in itself. It has three goals. To end colonization and occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. To end uh, all forms of discrimination and inequality, legal and otherwise, against Palestinian citizens of Israel. And to end uh, the uh, denial of Palestinian refugee rights, including the right of return. It doesn't take a position. The Palestinian civil society call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions doesn't take a position on one state or two states. I do, but that's my personal view. BDS is gaining ground. And you can see this in the desperate tactics that Israel and its uh, 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 supporters or defenders are taking. They're talking about the so-called threat of delegitimization. But nobody is delegitimizing Israel. Israel is delegitimizing itself through the actions that I have described, and I've only described a small part of them. Israel is delegitimizing itself. And all that is happening is that more and more people are starting to recognize it. And the Hasbara and the propaganda and the defamation and the vilification are no longer working because more and more people are learning the truth. And more and more people are asking what we can do. Here at the back of the room, you have two local groups at least, there may be more that you can go and talk to. The coalition to stop 30 billion to Israel, which I think correctly argues that as long as Israel receives unlimited military support from the United States, it has no incentive to seek a nonviolent path out of this morass. And the um, campaign which has been nationally sponsored by Jewish Voices for Peace and uh, by local groups uh, to uh, persuade TIAA CREF, the largest pension fund in the country. I, am a, uh, I have a uh, modest TIAA CREF account, and I have signed the petition calling on TIAA CREF to divest from Israel. And there are many faculty uh, in this room who uh, are likely to have TIAA CREF accounts as teachers or educators, and I would urge them to go to the table at the back afterwards and, and learn about the importance of that. But there are many other actions around the country. BDS, contrary to some of the critics, produces the conditions for dialogue. Doesn't shut off dialogue. It in fact produces the conditions under which dialogue and eventual negotiations could take place because it holds Israel accountable. And it's modeled on what happened with apartheid South Africa. There, as long as whites in apartheid South Africa felt immunity, they, could, they felt they could carry on with apartheid forever. And they could vilify and demonize the struggle against apartheid. 
It's only recently, a couple of years ago, that Nelson Mandela was taken off the U.S. terrorist list. But remember, for the United States and for the South African government, for other supporters of the apartheid regime in South Africa, like uh, 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 governments in Europe and many businesses, uh, uh, they resisted sanctions. They resisted BDS. But it was a popular movement that forced politicians to begin to listen and to begin to hold them accountable. And the effect inside South Africa as this form of solidarity uh, was to strengthen the internal movement against South Africa, against apartheid within South Africa. So it was a call that came from within South Africa, from, Palestinian, from South African civil society. Now, some of the critics of um, BDS against South Africa used to say, like Margaret Thatcher, she used to say, sanctions hurt the people they're supposed to help. This was an excuse not to apply sanctions to South Africa. And the response from Archbishop Desmond Tutu was, don't make our chains more comfortable. And Palestinians today are saying, don't make our chains more comfortable. Because the unlimited so-called humanitarian aid from the European Union is, yes, it's staving off some of the worst effects of Israel's occupation. Palestinians have been reduced to penury by the occupation. Their economy has been destroyed. Their agriculture has been destroyed. And this is what has reduced them to reliance on UN food handouts. People who are perfectly capable of working and farming and building industries themselves are reduced to food handouts because of what the occupation has done to them. And all this humanitarian aid, in the absence of a political process to end the occupation and Israel's other forms of oppression, is simply prolonging the occupation. It is making the chains more comfortable. It is keeping the, the suffering in Gaza at just the level where people can ignore it and keep their consciences clean. And it's up to us to break this cycle and to say we will not make Palestinian chains more comfortable by engaging in endless negotiations, engaging in empty dialogues between people who are too unequal to negotiate. So this is an intervention. It's an intervention for peace. It's an intervention for justice. And it's one that I believe will work. And this is why we have heard the sort of vilification and defamation, not just against me, but against the whole movement. I want to show you, in ending, something that I received today that I found so despicable. This is the New Mexico Link, the official newspaper of the uh, Jewish Federation of New Mexico, which contains a cartoon which, uh, which literally uh, compares I'm sorry, we keep losing the Ustream, and they'll be very cross with me. You're not the only ones listening here. We'll get it back now. Right. It literally compares the BDS movement. You can't see this, but I've posted a picture of it on my Twitter stream. It literally compares the BDS movement, to Hitler and Satan. You claim that the new, Hitler says to Satan, you claim that the new BDS movement is a replay of my Nazi program to boycott and divest economically, strangle the Jews. Satan says, yup, it's got everything but the swastikas. This ugly defamation will not work. This ugly defamation is an insult to those who died in the Holocaust. It cheapens their memory. It cheapens their suffering. And that it should be used in defense 
of an ugly apartheid regime is shameful. And I would call here tonight on the Jewish Federation of New Mexico to apologize for this despicable defamation against people who are working for peace and justice. I have spoken for too long, and it is now your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I yeah. think there's a moderator. So the moderator will be coming, Professor Field. If I can figure, yes, it's working. We're going to take some questions now. And what will happen is that we'll hand you the microphone so that you can have your question. And again, please, um, if you're going to make some comments, limit them to a couple of minutes and have a question for Mr. Abunima that um, uh, helps us to further uh, this conversation along. So um, let's give the microphone to that man. Maybe would it make well <clears throat> thank you so much for coming uh, it's been a, a great great speech uh, very briefly I'm, you quoted from a lot of news sources uh, today it's been very informative I'm wondering if you can address a little bit about the state of media coverage about these conditions you know uh, what state is the free press in Israel in the Gaza and also can you address how BDS is perhaps using social media I mean are there some Facebook's and Twitter stuff because I'm blogging about these sort of issues and interfaith issues as well so I'd like to just get your take on uh, uh, the free press and in that area and what the BDS is doing in terms of social media well the mainstream media in this country has utterly failed on this issue I mean it's become such a servant of uh, state power and corporate power on every issue that uh, we don't find space for dissent we don't find space for argumentation and uh, I think that the collapse of the traditional media models and the monopoly that uh, large capital intensive media corporations have is very welcome I really welcome the, the collapse of the old model because it's opened the space for so many other people uh, and, and um, uh, so much of the information is available on social media, it's available on uh, international networks and uh, foreign newspapers and websites that are available to us here. But our media in this country, our grand uh, uh, newspapers of record and so on, uh, are so carefully, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're so carefully censored and nuanced to reveal uh, just enough, but not, not quite enough. And uh, the biases are so apparent. So I think social media has opened it up. The fact that so much of the settler violence is um, filmed and seen on YouTube. You don't see that settler violence on the nightly news. Um, the fact that uh, we were able to uh, you know, the Israelis, when they carried out the attack, uh, the surprise attack on the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, which was in fact heading away from the Israel and Gaza coast at the time Israel attacked it. How do we know that? Do we know that because the mainstream media reported on the direction the ships were heading? No. We know it because um, 
the publication I work with, the Electronic Intifada, we got the, uh, the tracking data from the ship, which was in fact publicly available, and we plotted it on a map. And we could see exactly where the ship was when it was attacked. Uh, and uh, the footage, which shows the, uh, so much of the Israeli, you know, when the Israelis captured the ship, uh, a kid hijacked the ship and forced it to, uh, to uh, Ashdod, they then confiscated all of the media uh, from the ship, all of the cameras, all of the recordings, and so on and so forth. But one passenger on the ship, Yara Lee, had managed to sneak out her uh, SD card. And we have about an hour of footage which was released online. I, I'm not aware of any mainstream media or major media, media except perhaps Al Jazeera playing some of that footage, but it was available on the internet, and the footage showed us the indiscriminate firing by Israelis. It showed us a uh, working journalist uh, who, was, who was shooting with his camera one minute, and the next minute he was lying dead on a stretcher. All of this was, was not thanks to the mainstream media. So uh, I think it plays a, a tremendously important role, and it is what Israel is, is really uh, flummoxing Israel and they have tried all these strategies to pay people to go on Twitter and uh, you know disseminate Hasbara that's the Hebrew word for essentially propaganda but it's not really working and it's not gaining any traction because it's not just the medium it's also the message and if you don't have a message then you're not going to win people to your uh, side I think what we're going to ask people to do is to form a line in this middle um, row and then we'll pass the microphone between and then we won't have as much logistics here. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I have um, just uh, two brief witnesses and a question I'd like to ask you. Um, I lived in uh, Jerusalem as Jordan from 1960, 1960, 61, 62, and 63. Um, my stepfather was one of the army officers working with the International Peacekeeping Force. Mm -hmm. The headquarters for the United Nations was in Jerusalem. My stepfather happens to still be alive. Keep talking. He has told me that in all of his time there, all the negotiations, conversations, deliberations were only with Israeli military officers. There were no discussions with Palestinian leaders. That was that long ago. The second thing I'd like to say is because we were with the United Nations, I traveled a great deal, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. I saw the great sights of Egypt. But as a young teenager, the most impressional thing I ever saw was the Gaza refugee camp. I can never forget that. I will always have a deep feeling about that. Uh, but my question to you is, do you think there's any possibility of a role for the United Nations and that area conflict today. The United Nations plays an important role through uh, UNRWA, through the provision of relief services to Palestinians, and uh, that and an important documentation role. Um, and uh, the problem, though, is that the UN is not fulfilling its political role of. Um, uh, addressing threats to international peace and security. You have the world's longest military occupations in this area. You have numerous Security Council resolutions uh, declaring that uh, Israel's efforts to change the demographics, its construction of settlements, its Judaization of Jerusalem is illegal and has to be stopped and reversed. You have numerous uh, UN commissioned reports, including the Goldstone Report, that document allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And none of the mechanisms seem to be working to bring these people to justice. Why is that? So yes, the UN ought to have a role. Uh, if the mandate of the UN was followed 
it would have a tremendously important role, but unfortunately, unfortunately, it has abdicated that mandate. And a large part of that is because the United States has used its presence on the Security Council to veto any action whatsoever to hold Israel accountable. And that means that the UN is simply uh, uh, totally stymied. I <clears throat> Uh, you discuss a lot uh, what you call the, the first-tier discrimination of uh, Arab Israelis. I just have a, a, a small question then. If, as you say, the Arab Israelis suffer such uh, rough discrimination, how come in every survey and in every conversation I had with Arab Israelis, uh, in the position uh, the parliament, our members, uh, having how come they are terrified by the idea of becoming Palestinian citizenship once, uh, uh, Palestinian citizens once a Palestinian state will be established in the West Bank without being expelled from their houses, living in Taibe and living in Umm al-Fahim, just become, change their citizenship to Palestinian. Why they're so terrified by this idea, and it is proven one time after another that they are, why is it then? Usually people who are very discriminated. Are you proposing that uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel be stripped of their citizenship? No, I'm just asking if this well, discrimination what they object exists. To, excuse me, yes, let me answer your question. What they object to is the notion that they should be stripped of their citizenship because of the, they're the wrong ethnicity. They are the original people of the country. They did not choose to be Israelis. Israel, Israel was established on their land when they were already there. Now, what they call for overwhelmingly in every single survey is a state of all its citizens. We're broadcasting again, the battery ran out. <laughs> for the people listening on the internet, the uh, iPhone is now plugged into the wall, so it shouldn't happen again. Um, they overwhelmingly call for Israel to be a state of all its citizens. And what they object to, and I object to, and we should all object to, is this 19th century notion that people can be stripped of their citizenship because they're the wrong type of human. The equivalent in this country would be the following, okay? That uh, California and Texas have just become what they call uh, majority-minority states, okay? Uh, and New Mexico, I believe that there is, I don't know the demographics of New Mexico so well, but what you're talking about is if Texas declares that it should be a white and democratic state, and the solution to maintain its status as a white and democratic state is to strip the American citizenship of all Texans with Hispanic or Latino ethnicity and make them citizens of Mexico. Now, even if Mexico were the most wonderful state in the world, uh, and it is a wonderful country, don't you see how appalling that is? If you can't understand how appalling that is, then I think you really need to have some introspection into, uh, into uh, what's wrong with the Israeli claim to be a Jewish and democratic state. It's a, it's a notion that says, we can rob you of your citizens' rights just because you're the wrong ethnicity. That's a terrible, terrible ideology. I didn't offer this, and hardly Asking anyone why offers people, this. You're, you're saying, oh, excuse me, don't say hardly anyone offers this. Hardly anyone. This hardly, don't say hardly anyone offers this. I will give you some numbers, okay? okay? All right. The Israel Democracy Institute 
2009 Israel Democracy Index, 54% of Israeli Jews say the state should encourage Arab citizens to leave. Avigdor Lieberman, who gained 15 mandates at the last Knesset election, made this proposal to the United Nations in September. These sorts of repugnant ideas are gaining ground in Israel, and Israelis should be standing up to fight against them. Israelis should be saying, we will not tolerate this sort of racism. I still didn't understand why they are terrified being Palestinian citizens. Why they don't want to be Palestinian, if they are Palestinians. You call them Palestinians, they are Palestinians. They want to be citizens who are equal to all the other citizens in the state. What's wrong with that? Do you have, let me ask you a question, okay? Do you think that everybody in Israel should have fully equal rights before the law regardless of ethnicity, religion, national origin? Of course, and it's much closer than what you described. The highest uh, percentage of uh, academics in the Arab world is in Israel, within Arab societies. I'll give you an example. The Palestinian population in Israel is 20%. Their representation in the universities is 8%. In some universities, there's barely a single Arab faculty member. You probably haven't been to Haifa University, to, uh, to, been, to the Hebrew uh, University lately. I'm giving you numbers that describe the entire situation. You, you have to look at the fact that uh, uh, Arab students aren't entitled to study in all fields that they face uh, in the civil service, that 20% of the population uh, as a whole and uh, less than 6% of the civil service. How else do you explain the fact that their poverty rate is above 50%? And not only that, uh, I mean, they're not stupid. Everywhere else, Palestinians have some of the highest achievement rates of, of anywhere in the world. You have a state that discriminates very systematically, and it sounds like you're in denial about that. This is a waste of time. When I read that many Jewish people were upset that you were coming here, maybe more determined to come here, my question is, um, my question is, why can't or won't America stand up to Israel? And why is it that when someone says something negative about Israel, the Jews, they end up losing their jobs or losing their careers? That's a whole lecture. <laughs> well, I think that there's a phenomenon. I do believe that um, the role of uh, what has been loosely termed the Israel lobby is important and does have an influence on American policy, but I think its grip is weakening somewhat. And that's partly because I think that the um, mainstream pro-Israel community in the United States is moving further and further to the right and out of the American mainstream. I mean, you look at some of the examples. This was uh, reported on, uh, on the Mondo Weiss website uh, just yesterday that uh, three memorial events for the uh, uh, Rabbi Meir Kahane are being held throughout New York City this Sunday in ceremonies marking 20 years since he was killed. Uh, they're being held at the o Ocean Avenue Jewish Center in Brooklyn, uh, at the site of Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan, uh, and at the West Side Institutional Synagogue. Uh, and Rabbi Meir Kahane, who essentially now, at the time he died, he was on the fringe in Israel, calls for the um, expulsion of all Palestinians. Kahane has n is now almost at the Israeli center, his ideas. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, you have seen the death of any sort of progressive or liberal trend within Zionism, uh, if one could describe such a thing, and it has been taken over by the most extreme elements. And uh, I think this has a, an impact on American policy. There is an alliance also with um, extreme Christianist uh, movements in this country who want to see the United States transformed into a Christian state. Uh, and this has accelerated after September 11th, 
where we saw some of the mainstream uh, Zionist groups like the ADL, for example, making an alliance of convenience with some of the most intolerant forces in this country, like uh, Pastor John Hagee of Christians United for Israel. And, um, but the, the trends I see that are so positive is that I think, uh, whereas at the top among the political class, there is still great fear of criticizing Israel. Uh, I think that among younger people on college campuses, among young American Jews in particular, uh, there's a much more critical and open debate. And I think this is going to filter up from the grassroots, but it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time. I also think that as the debate becomes more open, as the discussion about what's really happening becomes more um, uh, uh, widespread, the efforts to stop it and to prevent it are becoming more extremist and more desperate and uh, more unscrupulous. And I think that the kind of thing we've seen here in Albuquerque with trying to stop or vilify or delegitimize this event is an example of that. Where anything goes, you can call me the Klan, you can call, call us Hitler, you can say what you... This will fail in the long run. Let me give some advice to Zionists, if I may. If Zionism is to have any long-term prospects, it must have a message other than fear and scaremongering and vilification and Islamophobia. But I do not see I do not see any such program based in universal values coming from Zionism. This is what we are arguing for. We are arguing for a settlement based on universal values and equal rights for all, including Israeli Jews. And it's a movement that is open to Israeli Jews who support equal rights for all. And they are starting to join in small numbers now but I think as the BDS movement uh, produces more introspection among Israelis and hopefully among some of Israel's uh, 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 unconditional supporters in this country, more and more people will come to the conclusion that universal human rights, not exclusivist, supremacist, separatist states, are the only way forward. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, um, one question, make a few statements, and uh, introduce myself, first of all. My name is Alex. I lived for the past 14 years in Israel. I have friends that are in the military. My brother was in the military. Uh, my mother is a peace activist that we used to work for, Meretz. That uh, she also, she had, a, uh, she had a meeting with Yasser Arafat before he died. She used to bring uh, food and uh, uh, food, shoes, anything that she could for the, to the kids in Gaza. Now, I want to make one statement. Did she fight for their right to return home? As much as she could. Good. Without using violence, of course. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to make is before I heard about um, how much is the mainstream inside uh, Israel, how much, are, how much do the people actually know, is there's a huge difference. I mean, I lived in Israel a long time. There's tons of stuff that I've never heard until I came actually to the United States where they suddenly showed me a different side to the story. Uh, there's a lot of ignorance among Israelis. Um, people don't even know how it is to be outside of Israel until they're 18 or after, after army. Now my question is, um, in Gaza, you talked a lot about, uh, about what Israel does to Gaza, but what about the Hamas? Mm -hmm. I mean, the people in Gaza, they voted for the Hamas to be the primary group, and uh, the just Hama Hamas, not the Hamas. Hamas, sorry. Okay. Um, and the, the Hamas, sorry, Ham <laughs> Hamas is doing a lot of trouble for the for Israelis, like because the a lot of, the big excuse for the military why they don't let a lot of people a lot of people going out and in a lot of movement, even when it comes to food, 
is because that there's a lot of suicide bombers. There's a lot of there's kids walking with bombs on themselves. There's women without with a wooden leg with a bomb inside. Pregnant woman, a donkey. I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to see, like from the other side also. I, mean, I, I justify yeah. I justify most of what you said, but that's just a little thing yes. that you didn't touch. Let me let me touch on it then. First of all, as I talked about earlier, the Israeli government itself tells us that its policy of deliberate reduction of basic supplies is to punish the population of Gaza and to try to overthrow Hamas, which was elected. Now, even if what you're saying is correct, okay, I don't see how letting uh, chocolate or construction supplies or musical instruments into Gaza uh, would uh, enhance the risk of suicide bombings in Israel. Incidentally, uh, the last suicide bombing was uh, some time ago, several years ago, primarily because um, the Palestinian groups that were carrying them out decided that it wasn't a good tactic. I'm very glad about that. I think it was a disastrous tactic for moral and tactical reasons. Uh, um, I think targeting civilians is always wrong, regardless of who they are and who the perpetrator is. And I, agree, I agree only on that because um, they are exaggerating on the reaction. Well, but let's, say, let's, let's uh, continue with what you're saying. Um, Israel has a policy of um, preventing medical patients from leaving Gaza for treatment that they can't get in Gaza, of delaying permits, medical permits, uh, sometimes denying them, but often delaying them for lengthy periods to the extent that people die. And there have been several hundred cases of people uh, dying because they had permits denied or delayed and they couldn't get medical treatment. There's no possible security uh, motive for that. In fact, what we know is that there are several, uh, many documented cases of Israel blackmailing uh, patients saying that we will give you a permit to leave as long as you will inform for us, in effect become a collaborator. And there have been documented cases, a pattern of this, of Israel trying to blackmail people who need medical treatment, that if we let you out, that when you come back, you'll become an informer. I want to talk a bit about the security excuse because it is one of the widespread myths and propaganda points that Israel uses. Israel argues that its attacks on Gaza and its blockade is for security reasons. I've already explained that we know from Israeli documents and statements that that is incorrect. But we also know from simple chronological facts as well that it's incorrect. Now, actually, you said that uh, I didn't talk about what happens from Gaza to, uh, to uh, Israel. But actually, all we hear about from the Israeli spokespersons is this repeated claim, constant refrain, that uh, we left Gaza in 2005. Actually, all they did was move the occupation to the edge. We left Gaza in 2005, and all we got in exchange were rockets. And they cite a figure, I can't verify it and nor can you, but the Israelis claim that 8,000 projectiles, uh, either mortar shells or rockets, uh, none of them chocolate-tipped as far as I know, uh, have been fired from the Gaza Strip into Israel since uh, 2001. Have you ever heard have you ever heard, or has anyone else of these hundreds of people here ever heard an Israeli spokesperson tell us how many rockets or shells or missiles Israel has fired into the Gaza Strip since 2001? I, can, I just want to comment on that. No, I want, no, I want a number, because the Israelis are very good at giving us the number of projectiles. So do you know the number? The number is very low, but the killing... How are, many? Uh, tell me the number. I cannot tell you exact number. No, how do you know it's low then? I know it's low because Israel does, ha does have the military and does have the capability. Of okay, have, have let's, give, let's, let's get some numbers now. All right. Let's introduce facts into the equation. I actually don't know the entire number of projectiles fired by Israel into the Gaza Strip since 2001, but I can tell you that in an 18-month period from 
September of 2005 until May of 2007, according to Human Rights Watch, Israel fired 14,617 heavy artillery shells into the Gaza Strip, causing extensive death and destruction. Hundreds of civilians were killed during that period. Let me give you another number. According to Israel, on the first day of Operation Cast Lead on December 27, 2008, Israel dropped 100 tons, 100 tons of high explosives onto the Gaza Strip in the first day. I did a calculation, okay? I took the assumption that 8,000 rockets were fired from Gaza into Israel, okay? Now, a Qassam rocket, if you go on various websites or Wikipedia, I'm going to give you some numbers, okay? I asked you for numbers and you didn't give them to me, so now I'm going to give some numbers. And then you can answer. If you add up all of the, uh, the payloads of the uh, Qassam rockets, assuming there are 8,000, this is an Israeli claim. We have no way to verify it. It adds up to about 12 tons of low explosives made with fertilizer, fired over a period of a decade, compared with 14,617 high explosive military grade artillery shells fired in an 18 month period that we know about, and 100 tons of high explosives fired on a single day in December of 2008. Okay? Now, it's not true, as some people say, that the rockets have never, you know, killed any Israelis. Do you know how many Israelis have been killed by rockets fired from Gaza? Much fewer than in Gaza itself. 24. Okay. Do you know when the first Israelis killed were? I cannot recall now. Okay, you should do your homework. The first two Israelis killed were on 28th of June, 2004. And they included a child. They included a child called Afik Zahavi, age four, and an adult male, Mordechai Yosefov, aged 49. 24 were killed. Do you know how many Palestinians have been killed in Gaza? since 2001. No, forget about since 2001. Thousands. You know how many have been killed in Gaza by Israeli fire since June 1st, since January 1st, 2008? A lot. 2,100. Do you know how many Israelis have been killed in the entire conflict, in conflict-related violence since January 1st, 2008? How many do you think? Is it 500? 1,000? Um, you have to take into consideration all that. 60. No, I haven't finished my answer yet. So, did Israel have an alternative to bombarding Gaza and bombing half the schools and bombing half of the clinics? In Gaza? I yes, it did. Israel negotiated a ceasefire with Hamas, which began on June 26, 2008, and lasted until November 4, 2008. What was special about November 4, 2008? It was the presidential election in the United States, and nobody was paying attention when on that day Israel attacked the Gaza Strip and killed six people, ending in effect the ceasefire which it had negotiated with Hamas. And after that, the rocket fire resumed. And Hamas offered to renew the ceasefire, and Israel refused. And Israel went ahead with its attack on December 27th, 2008. So please do not give me 
excuses about security. If Israel wanted to protect its citizens, all it had to do was renew the ceasefire which it had negotiated with Hamas and which it violated on November 4th, 2008. Now we can go to the next question. <clears throat> Yes, Mr. Rabanima, thank you for coming to New Mexico. Uh, but I have some concerns uh, regarding the, the framework that you're describing for possible um, one country, as your book uh, is entitled. I wonder if uh, that uh, book would have a subtitle of Two Nations, because um, I think that uh, regardless of your very correct logic that uh, on the ground, um, Israel has basically decimated the possibility for a separate uh, Palestinian state. Um, the two groups, the two parties, the Palestinians and the Israelis, consider themselves still two nations. And obviously the institutions still reflect that. So what I'm wondering is, um, is, uh, is, is it to be said that Palestinian nationalism should be put aside and that what uh, the Palestinians will be dealing with in, hopefully in concert with uh, Israeli uh, sympathizers, it would be more of a civil rights movement. And also, why would we rely solely on BDS, uh, consumer boycotts and that sort of thing, and not also rely, since now we're bringing these two groups together, uh, on solidarity between um, Palestinian and Israeli workers, not to mention U.S. workers, who could uh, struggle, as the 30 billion group is doing, to... Um, cut off the aid that um, the U.S. has pumped into Israel. So I ask that uh, uh, in, in friendly, uh, not so much criticism, but just wanting to know more about the details. Those are good, good questions, and I do address them in my book. Uh, to some extent, I don't give all the answers because I think no, more minds need to be applied to this. But let's be clear that a single state will not eradicate uh, Israeli identity or Palestinian identity, those are likely to persist, uh, but it will provide opportunities for uh, different configurations and different kinds of solidarities to emerge that are impossible uh, when you have the binary of Palestinian versus Israeli or Arab versus Jew. And I think there are strong solidarities to, to be built among workers, among women, uh, and um, you know, what I've tried to look at in my work and, and my research is um, different models. I've talked about South Africa, that's a unitary state, which people said would never work. I did some research on this, uh, uh, and um, until just before the end of apartheid, the vast majority of whites in South Africa said a unitary state can never work, it will be a bloodbath, we have to have, uh, you know, sort of group power sharing and that sort of thing. Well, uh, in the end, the vast majority of whites accepted a universal franchise in a single state, and whites are doing uh, very well in South Africa, much better than uh, most of the black population, and that's one of the criticisms of the end of apartheid. Uh, in Northern Ireland, you have a similarly structured conflict between uh, a settler group, albeit they, the plantation of Ireland occurred 300 years ago, but this dynamic between settler and native has survived. And you have what is, uh, in effect, a binational or consociational state. It's another model of a liberal democratic state, but it's one that um, recognizes or enshrines uh, uh, more the idea of two communities or two traditions. So I think all those models have to be studied, and they all offer possibilities. Uh, and. You know, the young gentleman who, who was one of the first questioners was boasting about how in some pockets in Israel, like in Haifa, there's coexistence. You know, and this is one of the ironies. Uh, you, you have some defenders of Israel. When you say Israel is an apartheid state, they say, but there's so much, uh, uh, you know, the Arab citizens have so much rights and they love it and there's mixed uh, universities. And then you say, okay, let's have a single state. They say, but we can never live together. Totally contradictory and incoherent. So there are models that uh, should be explored. What we do know is that partition has failed utterly. The country is unpartitionable without tremendous violence. 
And I would predict that if another effort were made to partition historic Palestine, it would not lead to two states living side by side in peace, but the most likely outcome would be the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from within Israel. That would be one of the first and most likely outcomes. In terms of worker solidarity, I'd like to see much more of it. I would point to the action by the um, Dock Workers Union uh, local in uh, Oakland, California, a few months ago, who um, staged a one-day action to refuse to load, unload Israeli uh, ships uh, in solidarity with the, in protest at Israel's attack on the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. And uh, trade unions around the world, much less so in this country, but in many other countries, uh, are, have been supporting BDS and endorsing it in solidarity with Palestinians. Uh, and uh, I think that that's very important to acknowledge uh, and encourage. Um, well, first I'd like to say I am Palestinian. And what I think the main focus of a lot of people is, is that they focus too much on the deaths and not the people that are losing their legs and their arms that can't ever walk again or anything like that in Palestine. The numbers are a lot bigger than the deaths, and people focus too much on the people that are dying, which are low numbers, instead of the people that can't have life anymore because of the Israelis. And uh, to, with what you said about the Hitler article or whatever, the comedy thing, uh, I'd like to say that I think Israel... I, it's funny that they did that because Israel is pretty much doing to the Palestinians what Hitler did to the Jews. And I would like to get your opinion on what you think about that. Well, uh, I think we always have to be ca ca uh, com make comparisons carefully. Um, Israel has not established uh, death camps for Palestinians, although Gaza arguably is a concentration camp, literally. A concentration camp means a particular population is forced to live in a restricted area and deprived of uh, its uh, basic rights and is not free to leave. Uh, and concentration camps were not actually invented by the Nazis, they were invented by the British in Africa. Um, and uh, the second point, I think, is the ideology of uh, sort of a racial or ethnic purity, the genetic definition of a Jewish nation uh, has uh, remarkable echoes with uh, some of the uglier periods in history that is not just uh, about Nazi Germany, but eugenics and sort of genetic definitions of the nation were very common uh, in Europe and even in the United States to some extent. And Israel itself practiced eugenics in the 1950s uh, as well as some of the exposés done by Haaretz in recent years show. So I don't think one can make a straight uh, comparison, um, and sometimes those comparisons can sort of shut down the discussion. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to, to do that, to uh, understand that what Israel is doing to the Palestinians is awful enough on its own terms. But where I think there is a connection or that we should make or break is to say that uh, the horrors that were suffered by Jews at the hands of Nazis and other Europeans across Europe who collaborated with the Nazis um, uh, can never justify or mitigate what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. That the one does not uh, trump the other because Jews suffered enormously does not mean the suffering of Palestinians is unimportant or simply can be set aside. It's awful enough on its own terms. And um, uh, I wrote an article about this a few years ago called uh, Israel's Auschwitz Borders Revisited that talks about how within Israel everything is compared to the Holocaust. And no, the term Nazi is thrown about among Israeli politicians very casually. But um, if anyone else makes such comparisons, they're immediately labeled anti-Semitic and, and, and so on. I think we have to be careful. This cartoon that I showed, I think, does belittle the Holocaust. This Jewish Federation of New Mexico cartoon cheapens and belittles the suffering of Jews for crass political purposes. And, and we should never uh, ourselves 
uh, engage in that. I'm not saying that's what you were doing, but I think we always have to be on guard against that. And also, I thank you for pointing out the, the importance of focusing on the, the rights and needs of literally tens of thousands of Palestinians, tens of thousands who have been permanently uh, injured, uh, lost the use of limbs, lost limbs uh, uh, as a result of uh, uh, violence by the Israeli army, and particularly the mental health situation, the enormous needs in terms of mental health that you have most of the children in Gaza, something like 90% display one or more criteria for uh, PTSD or other serious uh, anxiety disorders, and the, the long-term impact of this on children's health and development is simply uh, incalculable. So that enormity of it, I think, is not always captured when we focus on, on deaths which end up being a stand-in for uh, suffering. Mr. Ab Abanema, uh, I'd like to make a statement on uh, solidarity on behalf of the Answer Coalition, if that would be fine with you. Um, sure. My name is Angel Pardo. I'm an organizer for the Answer Coalition here in New Mexico. I'm be, uh, good, uh, let's see here. Around the world and in, in this country as well, more and more people are becoming aware of the harsh reality that Palestinians have suffered under the Zionist occupation of their lands. We join the organizers of this event in solidarity with the Palestinians and the worldwide solidarity movement against Israeli apartheid. Throughout the past decades of colonial occupation of Palestinian lands, it has been the hope of the Israeli state and their sponsors in Washington that the Palestinians simply disappear in, into the shadows of history. Instead, it is a resistance of the Palestinians in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds that has inspired millions of people around the world. Their determination and tenacity have become a symbol to people everywhere struggling against occupation and war perpetrated by the United States and its allies. Palestine will be free. We must continue to stand up for the Palestinians and remember that without billions of tax dollars from working, pe from working people in the United States, the racist apartheid state cannot continue, not even for a day. Long live Palestine. Long live the right of return of the Palestinian people to their homes of origin. U.S. out of the Middle East. I encourage other co-sponsors to make a statement as well. Thank you. Hi. Um, one, I want to thank you for coming tonight. And I just want to say for everyone here, I fall under a very small group of people. My grandmother was in Dachau, and I am a very active Jew. And I was raised on the Upper East Side of New York City, which isn't exactly a pro-Palestine part of the country, as many people here know. And I just want to say to you, for something for you to consider in the future, is that, and one, I just also want to say for the gentleman who is here, and for my fellow Hillel members, because this is kind of something that they should think about too, um, I do think it's disgusting that it was the Jews and the Israelis who have brought in this um, Holocaust you know, parallel. And I think it'd be much more appropriate to make the similarity between the internment camps for the Japanese that were in the West. But I do want to say that, you know, what exposed me to the issues in Israel, what exposed me to the idea that, you know, because the Israels have the military power and because they are the, you know, strength in that you know, in that region between the Palestinians and the Israels, Israelis, that it is them who are more in the wrong than the Palestinians. But I do want to say it is in, rec in being taught, even though everyone who I know from home is for a two-state resolution who is more definitely by far pro-Israel than pro-Palestine, it, be be it has been my, you know, being informed about what the Palestinians have done wrong and not just what the Israel Israelis have done by being informed of both sides because I don't think anyone will try and argue that anyone in that region has done only good or has not done wrong. It's by being informed of both that I was able to come to the decision that the, you know, we need to reach out to the Palestinians and create a much safer and accepting you know, environment for them. And I think one thing that I really got personally annoyed with in tonight was that you talked about a single state resolution, 
but not the specifics of what you wanted in that. And you talked about all the things that the Israelis have done wrong, but never examples of you know, what Palestinians and what the people in the Gaza have done wrong to, in Gaza Strip have done wrong to, you know, kind of show... Uh, what you know, have the people in the Gaza Strip done wrong? I'm, I'm not saying that... I'm just asking you no, because well, you said well, I didn't talk about it. Well, what, what I'm saying is that we can't say that there hasn't been, yes, whether there were thousands and thousands of more missiles launched from Israel than from Palestine. We can't, we're not, I don't think anyone here is going to say that not a single missile was launched from, from Palestine. And so what I would just think is, you know, more beneficial is to say, this is what the Palestinians have done that we have to think about and see that it's not okay. And here's what the Israelis have done. And so you have to see the people who have all the funding and all, you know, the money and have the support of the West to, you know, throw, throw their, their ideas out there and kind of force their viewpoint. You know, they're really in the wrong here. But I, but I think what I kept on hearing was nothing bad about, you know, nothing negative ever coming from Palestine and only negative coming from Israel. What are the negative things that you would like to highlight? You have the microphone, go ahead. Well, for me, it's just that, you know, we can't say that there was no, um, there was no, you know, international crime, there was no warfare coming from Palestine. Okay, but uh, give specific... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a position to give, I'm not even going to try right. and say that I know numbers. I'm not going to be, I forget who okay. it was. Who I came just up want with to numbers. make sure that if there was anything that you felt I'd left out, that you had the opportunity it, to state it. All I, what I, what I, I guess what I'm trying to, sorry, I'm a little nervous. I guess what I'm trying to so take say, your time. what I guess I'm trying to say is that I felt as though I was hearing, even though I do side with you in, in general, I felt as though I was hearing a, only the Israels have ever done anything bad. And, that, well, and that's just one thing that, you know, well, that, that was just my interpretation. That's all I it think, is. I think that I appreciate the spirit in which you're speaking. Um, but I think it's a mistake in a situation like this to create a reality in which there is parity or equality when there isn't. So that it might make us feel very comfortable to say, that, well, both sides are wrong and everyone has done bad things. And that's true. I mean, Palestinians have on occasion done atrocious things to Israelis. But that doesn't get us out of looking at the overall situation that Palestine was targeted for colonization by the Zionist movement uh, with a specific program to turn a country which had um, an... Uh, overwhelmingly Arab Palestinian majority that was Muslim and Christian with a small indigenous Jewish population that had long been in Palestine and to turn it into an overwhelmingly Jewish country and that this could only be achieved by uh, the forced expulsion of the indigenous population. This is the analogy I would make. Nobody today argues that, uh, you know, or, de or deny, well some people do, but I would say there is widespread a recognition that uh, Native Americans, indigenous people in this country, were ethnically cleansed from their land and victims of genocide. Is there anyone in this room who wishes to object to that? It's also true that uh, Native Americans on occasion massacred uh, white settlers, including women and children. That's also true. Those two facts can be simultaneously true. But you have to understand the context of uh, a movement of violent colonization and the reaction of the indigenous people. Palestinians didn't get in ships and travel from Palestine to Europe to look for Jews to attack them. But the Zionist movement did get in ships come to Europe with the goal of taking over the land of the Palestinians. And we're not talking about history. We're talking about the present. We're talking about what's happening right now. We're talking about continued expulsion of Palestinians from their land. So uh, there are not two equal sides, even though it may make us feel better, it might make us feel more comfortable uh, to represent it that way. That's not the reality.
So, I mean, there might have been slaves who murdered their masters. That doesn't mean that, you know, slavery was both sides. You know, it's two, a two-sided story. So, I think that's a mistake that we have to avoid. Assalamu alaikum. I, I will stand up here and answer questions until somebody tells me to stop. I see a few people are filtering out. I don't know if there's an official end, but people who want to stay for a while, uh, you know, I'm happy to go on until people have had their chance to speak. Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as salam. Thank you. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Um, I'm in a, also just a very, very brief introduction in an unusual position. I grew up in a Zionist family. My mom did Aliyah. Um, and I lived in Jerusalem in the early 70s, spent time in Hebron with uh, Sufi Sheikh and on Zebel Zaytun also. So I did Shahada at that time. So for 30 some years, I've been practicing Islam, zikr, and also my Jewish studies, and bringing things together and working in my own deep way. You must have found many similarities. I have. They're extremely parallel. And in fact, it's known that it's in the 1300s and so, in the medieval times in Spain, there was a union of the mystical Arab and Jewish traditions at that time. So I've been living that, and my partner is a Muslim, Muslim as well. So in terms of the facts, we can prove everything that we want backwards. And, and also the other thing I shall say is that I've been uh, treated pretty badly by my siblings, my brothers who served in the Israeli army. Um, I've been very ostracized by my family. So I'm standing for this for a very long time. And in terms of the facts, we can debate facts ad infinitum, and people can show what they want to show, and people can hear what they want to hear. And it doesn't end the misery, and it doesn't end the suffering. And it, it may sound simplistic, but in the practice of the heart, which is at the heart, at the root of all of this, I mean, there's la ilaha illallah, and there's Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. They both say one, 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 one. It's not that we don't know this. We all, people, do say one, but then they don't live it, and they don't act it. And so in the deepest place that I'm trying to hold, what is it that can transform people's hearts so that they're not acting and living from fear and they're not acting and living from wishing only to hurt each other in order to protect themselves, but to wake up to exactly universal rights that it's only by everyone caring for each other. How can, uh, do you, what is your ideal? Yes. How could you express I'm something? I'm going to, I will talk about that. I will, thank you. I will uh, let the, if, if you don't mind, I'll let the person behind you speak and then I will address your question and hers together. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I just wanted to, to mostly um, hear your reaction. I feel um, one of few, possibly, here in Albuquerque. Some of you know me, my name is Leah Rosen. Um, I'm a long time, I'm very Jewish identified. I'm a, activist, feminist. I lived in Israel when I was 13. My grandmother was a Zionist of the kind that <clears throat> turned into, you know, these, um, it was not her dream. My father was a Zionist for different reasons. Um, living in Israel was very enriching for me as a young person. When I was in college, I had a little group with with uh, Mr. said and some others, it was 23 years ago. So there is an uprising from the youth and from progressive Jews. Judaism is a progressive tradition. What's going on here? A lot of us are outraged. While I don't, I, I have not stood in the one state 
solution. Uh, you know, I'm learning from being here with you and, and hopefully dialoguing with others ongoingly. I stand in solidarity with Jewish Voice for Peace out of Berkeley, which is an, uh, also a BDS movement, but also with J Street, which is a two-state and much more appealing to the mainstream and, yes, powerful Jewish community. It's, I feel, making uh, changes that need to happen. I feel whatever it takes to make the changes, whatever works, is where I'm at. Um, okay. I, you know, I could name all sorts of groups, but the point is, um, is there a place for somebody like me in your vision? And how can I align myself from a Jewish perspective with the people, as many people as I can bring along. Yes, yes. I understand your question. Was there a gentleman who wanted to say something behind you? The last one, and then... And, I, and I'll be very brief. Uh, I, I, I really appreciate the clarity and the way that your, your words and analysis and writing cut through the lies and fog and uh, racism of the kind of Zionist uh, indoctrination that many of us have like me personally, also coming from a Jewish American background, I've been subject to. Uh, and I just wanted to make uh, really two, two short points. Uh, the movement for uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions is an opportunity for everyone in this room to uh, make a just, uh, a just solution possible. Just if you had a family member, uh, if you had an uncle, who is uh, uh, physically violent towards his wife. There's a couple things you can do. You can you know, enable it, ignore it, support it, or you can say, okay, we're gonna, there's going to be consequences for, for this violence. BDS is applying consequences and trying to hold Israel accountable to, uh, to this. And all of us, everyone in this room, we can do something. We do not need to be passive spectators. The other thing is this is not just, uh, and, and I encourage uh, other, other Jews um, and everybody else, uh, this is not a Jewish issue. This is an issue, if you are a human being, you, uh, you should speak out about it. You should not let yourself be silenced or, uh, or scared uh, by, by the bullies uh, in the ADL and their ilk. Thank you for those questions and comments. Uh, I'd like to close with a couple of points and responses. One, what is the vision people want? I think that should be emphasized. One way to get the vision is to buy the book. <laughs> Don't make me carry them home. Um, a few years ago, I participated in uh, an effort which resulted in, it was a conference in Madrid, it resulted in something called the One State Declaration. And in it we tried to set out principles for what a single state would look like. Uh, or principles for any system that might be established, no matter what it looked like. This is a statement that, uh, that uh, was signed by uh, we didn't intend to come together as Israelis and Palestinians. It's just the people who participated in the conference, which included Israelis and Palestinians and uh, others, including Ilan Pape, an Israeli, who will be in Santa Fe on December 8th. Uh, so I don't have all the details, but to make plans to drive up to Santa Fe and hear, or take the beautiful train up to Santa Fe and hear him on December 8th. Um, and our, uh, we were inspired by a number of things. One was the South Af African Freedom Charter. We also looked at things like the Belfast Agreement. And we looked at uh, principles that we thought were fundamental to us. And you can find the One State Declaration online. I won't read the whole thing to you because it's too long. There's a preamble. But some of the key points. And this envisages a post, a decolonized Palestine. We borrowed from the South African Freedom Charter. The historic land of Palestine belongs to all who live in it 
and to those who are expelled or exiled from it since 1948, regardless of religion, ethnicity, national origin, or current citizenship status. Any system of government must be founded on the principle of equality in civil, political, social, and cultural rights for all citizens. Power must be exercised with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all people in the diversity of their identities. This we borrowed from the Belfast Agreement. There must be just redress for the devastating effects of decades of Zionist colonization in the pre- and post-state period, including the abrogation of all laws and ending all policies, practices, and systems of military and civil control that oppress and discriminate on the basis of ethnicity, religion, or national origin. The recognition of the diverse character of the society, encompassing distinct religious, linguistic, and cultural traditions and national experiences. The creation of a non-sectarian state that does not privilege the rights of one ethnic or religious group over another and that respects the separation of state from all organized religion. The implementation of the right of return for Palestinian refugees in accordance with UN Resolution 194 is a fundamental requirement for justice and the benchmark of the respect for equality. The creation of a transparent and non-discriminatory immigration policy. The recognition of historic connections between the diverse communities inside the new democratic state and their respective fellow communities outside. This would include both Jewish and Arab diasporic communities and Arab Jewish diasporic communities who have been cut off from their uh, Arab Jewish uh, tradition. In articulating the specific contours of such a solution, those who have been historically excluded from decision making, especially the Palestinian diaspora and its refugees and Palestinians inside Israel must play a central role. The establishment of legal and institutional frameworks for justice and reconciliation. And we conclude, the struggle for justice and liberation must be accompanied by a clear, compelling, and moral vision of the destination, a solution in which all people who share a belief in equality can see a future for themselves and others. We call for the widest possible discussion, research, and action to advance a unitary democratic state and bring it to fruition. Now, since we published the one-state declaration on the uh, 60th anniversary of the UN partition resolution, we've seen more and more people coming around to this. The thing I want to stress in terms of the question that was asked, uh, it is a mistake to view this as a menu where you go to the restaurant and you say, I prefer one state or I prefer two states. Uh, this is not a choice for you to make with all due respect. Uh, the reality now is of one state. And uh, the reality now is of massive, systematic, violent deprivation of rights for millions and millions of Palestinians in the name of preserving a so-called Jewish and democratic state that is neither Jewish nor democratic. And uh, we can no longer expend energy and time on that debate. The urgent thing, whether you feel the, uh, the final outcome should be one state or two states or ten, is to recognize that the BDS call of Palestinian civil society doesn't ask you or me to take a position on one state or two. It asks you to act to end the three-tiered system of apartheid, end the occupation of colonization of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Mind you, some activists have decided that's all they should do. And the BDS call says that's not enough. In addition to that, we must end all forms of discrimination within Israel, and we must treat the refugees with the same equality. Remember just a few months ago, Helen Thomas was vilified and fired from her job for saying that uh, 
uh, Israelis could go back to Germany or Poland. People felt outraged at that. Why is there no outrage when every single day people say, well, Palestinian refugees should get lost. Let them go and resettle in Canada or, you know, whatever, in the Arab countries. Why, is that, why isn't that I feel that outrage? Because to say that Palestinian refugees should simply lose their rights for the convenience of Israelis uh, is totally dehumanizing to Palestinians. There is no legitimate right of any Israeli that is threatened by the full respect and implementation for all the rights of the Palestinians. The only right that is threatened by that is Israel's right to be a racist state. And no such right exists. No such right exists. So I think that uh, we're at a moment where we are really, in a sense, entering the end game, uh, where the ideological battle of the Zionist movement is at a dead end. Zionism is unable to articulate a vision that doesn't rely on abhorrent human rights abuses for its maintenance, whether it's expulsion of Palestinians, whether it's formalizing their second-class status, what, whether it's passing loyalty oaths, whatever it is, there is no democratic outcome to Zionism. We have to understand that. And, but does that mean Israeli Jews can't live uh, in uh, a country where they ha have their culture, their language, their religion? Of course not. That's the situation in Northern Ireland now. Uh, there are actually, you know, one of the myths People say multi-ethnic states don't work. They always result in war. This is a, a huge myth. In fact, uh, most of the states in the world are multi-ethnic, and only a very few of them have wars. So actually, mostly multi-ethnic states do work quite well. But uh, what needs to be done is to address the basic injustices, to have equality. You know, the beautiful thing about equality is that it doesn't just benefit Israeli Jew, uh, Palestinians, it also benefits Israeli Jews. They will be beneficiaries of equality. They will be beneficiaries of citizenship. What it does mean in the short term, and I think this is what scares them, is a loss of power and a loss of control. What will happen to us? How will we be secure? How will we be safe? How do we know that the Palestinians won't do to us what we've done to them. I think those fears lie at the root of some of the uh, unwillingness to change. Those fears can be addressed. I mean, the same fears existed in the transition in South Africa, where whites were a much smaller proportion of the population, incidentally. They were about 10 percent. They're, they're still about 10 percent. Uh, but I think and I maintain that most Palestinians, the vast majority, are not interested in revenge. They are interested in justice. And justice doesn't mean uh, doing new injustices to others. But it does mean that Israeli Jews will lose uh, a privileged status. They will lose the um, uh, ability to decide unilaterally what happens in the country. Uh, and that's the way it should be, because it should be a democracy for all the people who live in it. That's ultimately where we should go. Thank you very much. Yeah. On behalf of the Coalition for Peace and Justice in the Middle East and um, all the co-sponsors, we would like to thank you all for coming out tonight and making this such a successful event. And we'd also like to thank Sahara and Cafe Istanbul for catering. And of course, we thank Ali Abunima for coming and taking the time to come and speak to us and informing us on this issue.
So my name is Danny Mustafa. I am the co-president here um, with Coalition for Peace and Justice in the Middle East. I'm a freshman here at UNM. And I would like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you so much. And um, we have some, I'd like to thank some co-sponsors here, um, the UNM American Studies and Peace Studies Department, along with the UNM Coalition for Peace and Justice in the Middle East. Thanks um, to our other co-sponsors, Amnesty International at UNM, Coalition for Immigration, Race, and Social Justice, UNM Fair Trade Initiative, UNM Muslim Student Association, Answer Coalition, New Mexico, Another Jewish Voice Albuquerque, BDS New Mexico, Cambio, the Grey Panthers of, Grey, of Greater uh, Albuquerque, and the Coalition to Stop 30 Billion. And also, um, this, after this event, there's going to be a couple more this week. Um, you can see flyers at our table out in the front. And um, Arish Jafari, a Palestinian youth women's leader, is going to be here to speak. At, she's from Dehesha Refugee Camp. And this is going to be November, 8, or November 9th, this Tuesday, at 12.30 p.m. in the sub Mirage and Thunderbird room up in the third level. And also Poets Against Apartheid, um, Poetry Slam, Tuesday night, 6.30 p.m., Warehouse 508, on the first street. Pick up flyers um, at our table again. And um, I'd just like to make a statement about um, TIA craft real quick. The Albuquerque community is involved with a nationwide campaign asking TIA craft to divest from corporations which are um, directly benefiting from the Israeli occupation. Some of these corporations include Caterpillar, Motorola, and Northrop Grumman. And if you would like to know more information, Please see, please see the TIA CREF table um, back there. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Lesfield, a professor here at UNM. Good evening. I'd like to welcome Ali Abunima to New Mexico. Uh, he's going to be introduced by Ahmed Asad, uh, who will come after me. There's a few things I'd like to say before um, Ahmed introduces Ali. Um, the people who are here tonight, who have come to this event, have come through various kinds of routes and various sorts of reasons. We have different opinions. This is a contentious issue in the city of Albuquerque, in the state of New Mexico, in this country, and globally. And in this discussion that's going to ensue as a result of uh, Ali's presentation, Mr. Abunima's presentation, I'd like to urge all of you to show respect for one another, um, to not use name calling or epithets, any kind of uh, use of a word that's hurtful. Remember that we're here not necessarily to agree with one another, but to hear one another and to engage in dialogue. Um, I'm an anthropologist at this university. I'm a cultural anthropologist. I work with indigenous peoples in North, Central, and South America. I'm also a Jewish American. I was raised by fervent Zionists, refugees from Europe, and Holocaust survivors. I have had my own journey to come to this position, to be here, to welcome Ali Abunima, to be part of this event. And I think all of you who are here have had your own roads here. And I want to stress that necessity to honor one another to listen to one another, and to always try and see in the words of another person the humanity of that person. So please, in the discussion that follows this, try and, 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 uh, and find that respect in yourself for the other person. 
So I'd like to now introduce evidence and careful fact-finding and fact-checking. Abu Na'am is also author of the book One Country, a bold proposal to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which proposes to revive the ideas of one state shared by two peoples. Born in Washington, D.C., Abu Na'am has spent his early years in the United, the United Kingdom and Belgium before returning to the United States to attend college. His mother is originally from the village of Lifta, which is now controlled by Israel, but became a refugee in the 1948 Palestinian exodus. His father is from the village of Batir, now in the West Bank. Abu Na'am is a graduate of Princeton University and the University of Chicago and is a frequent speaker and commentator on the Middle East and, a cont and contrib contributing regu regularly to numerous publications. Without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to uh, introduce Ali Abu Na'ma tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Wow, I never imagined that I could fill up a ballroom. Uh, I find that particularly surprising because um, apparently there were some people who didn't want to welcome me in Albuquerque. But it looks like there's a pretty big welcoming committee here. Now, uh, I've just come from Santa Fe, and the dips and troughs in the landscape have done strange things to my ears. So if I suddenly keel over to one side, you'll know what's going on. Well, the first thing I want to say is I want to thank everybody who worked so hard to make my visit here possible. I've been looking forward to coming to New Mexico for such a long time. And uh, uh, there were many individuals, um, Gida Lester, uh, Dania Mustafa, who spoke a few moments ago, who I was in contact with, who uh, really worked to make this happen. Uh, but I know that they weren't alone. I know that any event like this takes many, many more people, and probably whose names I don't know. But I just want to assure all of you how much I appreciate the effort, particularly students who have uh, other things to do uh, other than organize events. And uh, I'd like to thank the UNM Coalition for Peace and Justice in the Middle East, the UNM Students Organizing Actions for Peace, nice acronym SOAP, the UNM American Studies and Peace Studies Departments, and there's a, a large number of groups listed on the flyer who have also co-sponsored co this event. I must say that uh, although uh, I have uh, developed a pretty thick skin, as you have to when you talk about Palestine, uh, I must say that the sorts of attacks made against me in the past few weeks in the run-up to my visit here by the Jewish Federation of New Mexico and by the Hillel at the University of New Mexico surprised me. Uh, I have been compared to the Ku Klux Klan I have been called an anti-Semite. Uh, I have been accused of wanting to destroy Israel uh, and all sorts of other things. So some of you may have expected uh, an ogre to appear before you rather than a fellow human being. My response to those uh, attacks has been to say that I hope those who launched them are here in the room tonight. I hope they're here. And uh, I can assure them, as I can assure all of you, that I'll be very happy to take all your questions. And you here will be the judges of what I say. I had a chalkboard, I would put up a map here. But these are the survivors of the ethnic cleansing, the Nekba, in 1948. 
In 1948, 90% of the Palestinians living in what became Israel were forced to leave or fled or were out of the country for study or travel or business or any other purpose and then not allowed to return, creating through ethnic cleansing a state with a Jewish majority. But the Palestinian minority remained behind. At that time, about 150,000 people. Today, they're 1.2 million through natural growth, and they're nominally citizens of Israel. They vote for the Knesset, and they live in the country. That's one tier, and I'm going to talk about them in a minute. The second tier is Palestinians who live in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the parts of Palestine occupied by Israel since 1967 up to this day. And there you have another approximately 4 million Palestinians, 1.5 million in the Gaza Strip, and about 2.5 million in the West Bank. And the third tier of Palestinians are those refugees in the diaspora, and refugees inside the country as well, because 80% of the people in Gaza are refugees. And what we have to see is an end to the three-tiered system of apartheid that targets these three groups of Palestinians if we're to see peace. Let's start with Palestinians in Israel. They're nominally citizens of the state. They vote, but they experience uh, forms of discrimination and inequality that are not just social and economic and cultural, but entrenched in Israeli law. And what we see is this entrenchment in Israeli law becoming more and more uh, extreme. Yesterday in Santa Fe, I spoke to an audience and there was a group of students from the United World Colleges in Santa Fe which included several Israeli students and I was really delighted to see them in the room. And they asked some very good questions. One young man in particular, I hope he won't mind me saying his name was Amir, and he said, well, why are you focusing on Israel, you talk about all these negative things, but every country has negative things. The United States has racism. The United States has all sorts of inequalities and problems. I said, that's true, but the difference is that the United States has a vision of a society enshrined in law in which there is equality. We have this in uh, employment uh, discrimination laws in equal housing opportunity, equal employment opportunity, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. Does this mean we've eliminated racism in this country? Of course it doesn't. But it means we've set legal and constitutional standards that we aspire to and can struggle for. Israel is moving in the opposite direction. It's moving in the direction of entrenching a system of apartheid that uh, is not just a slogan, a nice slogan of a Jewish and democratic state, but is actual apartheid. Uh, sometimes you get a lot of criticism when you use the word of apartheid. I remember when I first started using it to describe the situation in Israel, I was told, well, this is very hurtful and this is very inaccurate. But Israelis themselves use it all the time. On October 31st, Zvi Bar El, the uh, columnist in Haaretz, wrote in an article called South Africa is Already Here. Israel's apartheid movement is coming out of the woodwork and is taking on a formal legal shape. Uh, Ahmed Asad, who is a Palestinian American attorney and the owner of Asset Associates since 1995. His practice is in criminal defense, civil rights, and personal injury, and he has a limited practice in the field of international law. He was appointed by the International Criminal Court 
as ad hoc counsel to the Harun Kutiab in Darfur. He's also a member of the defense team representing uh, Abdrahim al-Mashiri, who was charged with masterminding the bombing of the USS Cole. Uh, Mr. Assed has been in various organizations that are devoted to the establishment of a Palestinian state and in bringing about a lasting peace between the Palestinians and Israelis. He's also a past president, <clears throat> excuse me, of the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee and its New Mexico chapter, and also serves as board member for the ACL ACLU in Albuquerque. He also would like you to all know that he is married with five wonderful activist children. And so I'd like to welcome Mr. Asad. Good evening. When I was uh, first asked uh, to introduce uh, Ali uh, tonight, I was extremely delighted and honored. And then uh, I went into panic mode uh, because uh, of my uh, um, information and my knowledge related to the concept of a one-state solution was mainly limited to a couple of articles, a discussion here or there. So the first thing I did was buy his book. Um, and uh, it was, it's titled One Country. I, I think that they may be uh, available here. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic um, book. I encourage you all to read it and to understand uh, the dimensions involved uh, and what Ali uh, states in his book and what we'll hear about, I'm sure, tonight. But in reading the book, it certainly reminded me of the failed uh, current and past attempts at um, resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, ending the occupation, and bringing about a peace between the Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, if you look at the scenario today, uh, things are not getting better. They're actually getting worse. Um, the, the uh, attempts are, have failed and, has, uh, and are disastrous. We look at Palestinians in the West Bank con continuously reminded of the occupation. We, we see the expansion of settlements without any international consequences. Uh, we see the systematic cleansing of Palestinians in Jerusalem. We have one million Palestinian, Israeli Palestinians that fear of losing their identity, uh, that fear of being uprooted and shipped somewhere God knows where. We have one, one point, over 1.2 million Palestinians that still are imprisoned in Gaza, cut off from the rest of the world, and live in horrific conditions. With these brutal facts in mind, I have been, um, through this process, convinced that a new direction is needed. And maybe this one-state solution is the, is, is the direction that we need. It is certainly a viable option. And hopefully tonight, uh, this, we will hear more from Ali with regards to this topic. And you will go away understand, more understanding of this concept. I believe this concept is based on hope. I believe it's a positive message rather than a negative one. And I wish all of you walk away tonight having a better understanding and realizing that this may be the direction we need. I certainly have been convinced. So in doing so, let me go ahead and, uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, Ali. Ali Abu Nama is a journalist and co-founder of the Electronic Intifada, a not-for-profit independent online publication about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Electronic Intifada addresses the prevailing pro-Israeli slant in U.S. media coverage by offering information from a Palestinian perspective. The, uh, our, our U.S. media coverage by offering information from a Palestinian perspective. Our views on the conflict are based firmly on universal principles of international law and human rights conventions. And our reporting is built on a solid foundation of documented evidence. Because I stand in front of several hundred people and I'm ready to answer your questions and to stand up for what I believe in. Now, uh, the, I think ultimately what this comes down to now is what is our vision? If we were to ask some of those 
who have turned sadly to vilification and defamation rather than constructive dialogue. What is your vision for the future of the people in Palestine or Israel or whatever you want to call it? What's your vision for them? How do you want them to live in five years, in 10 years, or 50 years time? And I don't hear a vision. I don't hear a vision, at least not one that I can relate to. What I hear is a lot of hate, of speech which denigrates other people, speech that ignores facts, ignores reality. And what I want to put before you is a vision. And it's a very simple one. It's that all the people who live in Palestine and Israel, five and a half million Palestinians, five and a half million Israeli Jews, and about a million people who would be neither, should enjoy all their human rights. For this, we are being vilified. That we ask that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights be applied to all the people living in Palestine, including Palestinians, and to those who have been violently expelled from Palestine and denied their rights to return for the sole reason that they are, in the eyes of the State of Israel, the wrong type of human being. For me, there is no wrong type of human being. There's only one kind of human being. And that is the vision that I think we have to work towards. But if we want to get to a different reality, we have to recognize the reality today is a very ugly one. We're not going to get through this by simply pretending that if we talk about peace and we have dialogue groups and we have a peace process that goes on forever and ever, that we're going to have a good outcome. We've had now almost 20 years of so-called peace talks that have led to a worsening situation, a dramatically worsening situation for millions of Palestinians. No wonder Israel says, we love peace talks. We love them so much that we'd like them to go on forever and ever. But that's not going to get us to justice and it's not going to get us to peace. We can start on the road to a real just peace by recognizing where we are today and then asking how we get out of it. And where we are today is an ugly, triple-tiered, three-tiered system of apartheid. This is the reality. I understand that Zionists don't like to hear these words. They would prefer to talk about me than to talk about apartheid in Palestine. But I'm not the issue here. The issue is the apartheid in Palestine. And it's a three-tiered system because it affects Palestinians, different groups of Palestinians in different ways. We can think of the Palestinian people as being three broad groups. One group is Palestinian citizens of Israel. I, if we